Starting our next uh, investor panel on uh, IoT, VR, gadgets, smart home, and general hardware. So please join us. Daniel Stelerov will uh, moderate this discussion. Uh, Kirill, Eb Eb <coughs> sorry, Cyril Eberweiler, Imeric Renard, Lou Zang, Guy Reshev, Emily Behar, and Matt Carbonara. Please take seats. Daniel will moderate this session. We have uh, 15 minutes to discuss recent trends, uh, investment environment. When we're done, we'll switch to presentation. Uh, sure. Works? OK. Um, folks, did you, did you have a chance to introduce yourself? Should we start with that? Yes. OK. So um, why don't we start on, on the left? Maybe a, a quick introduction. Who do we have on stage? Hi, my name is uh, Emmerich Renard. I'm with uh, Hardware Club. We're an international hardware-focused venture fund. Main operations are in Paris and uh, Silicon Valley, investing up and down the value chain around hardware, everything from components to enterprise, consumer, clean tech, precision agriculture, aerospace, other forms of transportation, manufacturing, automation, et cetera, mostly investing at the pre-seed, seed, and uh, Series A levels. Hi, everyone. This is Lou. I'm the founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund. We're a Silicon Valley Palo Alto-based uh, firm focused on early stage tech and healthcare investment. Investor stage range from C to Series B. Hi, my name is uh, Cyril uh, Ebersweiler. Um, I am a general partner at SOSV uh, and founder of Hacks. Um, at Hacks, we've invested in over 300 uh, hardware companies uh, focusing on uh, consumer electronics, medical devices, uh, enterprise IoT, and infrastructure hardware. We have offices uh, in Shenzhen and San Francisco. Hi, I'm Emily Becker. We actually um, build, fund, and acquire early stage startups. But for today, uh, we're a dedicated fund that does pre-seed, seed, A and B um, in the US, Tel Aviv, Europe, and India in Frontier Tech. Hi, my name is Guy. Uh, I'm a partner at Grove Ventures. Uh, we're early stage investors, seed and A, and we write the first check for deep tech. Anything that is so technically complex, so uh, uh, hard to do that no one will do it, we will do it. Hey, Matt Carbonar with uh, Cisco Investments. We invest around uh, $200 million a year. Uh, total team is about uh, 40 uh, professionals. Uh, I lead the segments responsible for enterprise networking collaboration and relevant to this panel, IoT. A uh, sweet spot for us is probably Series B, but we'll invest earlier and later than that. And typical check size is in the 3 to $5 million range. Well, thank you. Uh, before we jump into questions, um, let's do a quick poll. Um, has your fund or company invested in hardware? Because essentially we'll be talking hardware. Who, who, whose firm invested in hardware? All right, so we, we essentially have a, a very relevant panel here. Uh, so let me start with, 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 the, with your thoughts on what the investor sentiment now actually is. Um, investing in hardware historically has been a tough space for investors for very good reasons. You know, low margins, working capital requirements, tough to scale, you need retail channels and all the rest of stuff. A couple of years ago, 2015, there was an explosion of hardware investing. Uh, I think people thought that suddenly the barriers have fallen and we have a renaissance of, of hardware investing. Um, I think the dollar numbers are still high, but, but I think the general sentiment, if you ask a, a, a CEO of a hardware startup now, what's the, what's the attitude that he's facing among investors, he would say it's tough. Right? So maybe let's talk about what, what, what do the investors think about hardware investing? Well, I'd say for, you know, f like for some of us here uh, who are dedicated to hardware, um, you know, we've stayed, of course. Well, we, where we see a lot of hesitation are some of the folks who have, you know, maybe dabbled is a, is a harsh word, but have the occasional hardware investment within the larger portfolio, especially some that are kind of new to it. Uh, you know, they saw some signs in the marketplace, some early exits, they got excited, they jumped in, then they see some things cratering, or they have a bad experience with one of their portfolio companies, it kind of scares them. It's kind of like watching someone learn to, to drive stick shift for the first time, a lot of jerkiness, and then have some of them kind of walk away, kind of traumatized, and vow to never do it again. And so there's a little bit of that right now. And then you see some of the people who said they wouldn't do it, all of a sudden, they, again, more positive exits come out, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, wait a second, maybe there is a future there. 
Yeah, I think it's it's probably funny to to think that there is a, I think only eight percent of uh, the total you know VC amount um, uh, spent every year that goes to to hardware in general, um, and yet you know you see those uh, recurring billion dollar companies uh, that are getting you know scooped out uh, by by Amazon and Google and, and Facebook and and others, and so uh, and there are more you know like like Peloton uh, and of course you know all the the mobility companies that are, are coming out. Um, that are uh, also you know billion dollar companies, and so um, you know there is there is a, a bit of the narrative that is missing out um, here um, about the, I think the general sentiment, uh, which is probably not that bad, but um, it's also uh, dependent on the industry, and so it, it's been very visible over the year that you know consumer electronics is uh, is where the biggest flameouts are are happening, but also very big uh, exits, um, and thanks to the market. Um, but it's, it's also interesting to see really the beginnings of, uh, of uh, the uh, enterprise IoT and you know all, every other things related to automation, which is fairly new, uh, and that uh, I think you know investors are, are starts to get interested in, into it. Yeah. Just as uh, you just mentioned that actually the I think lots of the uh, hot, like the buzz around the hardware, like in 2015, is about uh, consumer product, consumer hardware. But now, lots of the new innovation opportunity is a hardware application for industry enterprise into the legacy uh, industry. Like how to combine a new technology, low cost sensor, to really power the next generation of the automation. So that's one thing. Another thing is, I feel now we have a new concept of the hardware innovation. It's not the purely just a piece of hardware. It's an integration of the software and the hardware, and the power with the data and provide a personalized uh, uh, feedback and result together using the hardware as a data entry. For example, lots of people don't like, lots of investors don't like hardware. Even fewer investors like medical device because it sounds like super hard frontier and capital intensive. But, but for since 2000, early 2017, there's a new trend about AI in healthcare, which is a good combination of how to adapt and also apply AI technology with the traditional hardware medical devices. So that's also a new opportunity I saw happening dramatically this year. Um, so uh, I, I agree with your with your comment. Uh, that's what we're seeing, at least at the early stage, that the dollar amount is uh, not decreasing, but for sure the number of deals is is decreasing, and that means that check sizes are growing larger. And with larger checks, there's there's more scrutiny, and there's an expectation of more completeness on team, on technology, on market validation. So I think that's the phenomenon we're seeing. I think a couple things about the hardware. I think one, it's, it tends to be a little bit of a hitster in business, so I think you really have to focus on that user experience. I do think the the alternative is, it's not necessarily. It can hardware can be the delivery mechanism for value of other types, whether it's data or uh, you know other types of value that I think uh, consumers or enterprises really care about. And I think that's that's the way I would think about it. Is yes, hardware can be delivery mechanism, but the value is really in some other piece of the ecosystem, whether it's the data or software or how that how that's delivered. Okay, uh, we've seen some we've seen some some very large and spectacular failures in the hardware space. Right? Everybody remembers Jawbone, uh, Pebble, uh, Skull Helmet. I think burned every venture lending firm in the valley that I know of. Um, did we learn anything there? Do you, what, what do you think were the takeaways? Well, one of the things is uh, design matters, utility, value proposition matters. Some of those companies flamed out in part because the products weren't, uh, you know, weren't f good fundamentally. And some confused design from having a very flashy, cool looking uh, thing from ha really how it fundamentally worked. I mean, you know, that was the case with Jawbone. I mean, frankly, you know, Jawbone, if you remember, that was a company that morphed from doing Bluetooth earbuds to speakers to wearables for health. And you know the earbuds came with like 15 different adapters. None of them fit very well. These things were supposed to be noise canceling because they rested against kind of your jaw. And they tended to flap around a lot and weren't that great. Uh, the bracelet famously were recalled after you know a, co a couple of weeks on the, on the market because they broke, they snapped really quickly. And that was kind of a design flaw as well and a manufacturing flaw. Uh, for some of the others, I'd say like, you know, Scaldi and Lily were ambitious, but were very, very tough to pull off technically. And there might have been a little bit of hubris in terms of what it would take to get those out to market. They're extremely complex products from an electromechanical point of view, fit and finish and, and things like that. Uh, and, you know, I think Juicero has been well covered, you know, by some of our colleagues who've done a teardown and kind of a, and some of the journalists who examined what it would actually do, right? It was very expensive for, for what you could do in uh, using alternative um, means. So you look at each of those kind of flamed out for different reasons, but at the core, it's kind of like complexity, cost, and really design, whether it be from a usability or a manufacturability perspective. 
Yeah, I was going to say Java is a great example because obviously at Samsung we have an incredible focus on releasing products, but I think sometimes the team doesn't appreciate the precision and the design expertise of the release of products. There's you know, sort of a natural DNA of release and have consumer give you feedback, but it goes on the shelf once. And so the, the take back is really a hit from the user behavior. And so there's a very different launch and technical skill required to do that, and not all teams invested in that. Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult in the consumer space. Uh, the bar is, is really high, and especially, you know, essentially what happened over the last 15 years is, is Apple standard for everything. Um, and so everybody's expecting that, uh, but unfortunately, you know, nobody can deliver on, on that level of quality. Yeah, so I, I think we all know the cliche that hardware is hard, but Consumer hardware is really hard. There's a, it's, it's just staggering the sheer number of things you have to get right. Um, it's a, it has to be a compelling use case, and it has to be a, a really delightful user experience. And after that, you need to get uh, uh, through manufacturing, and then you have to scale it. And uh, once you've done all, all of that, you need to build a consumer brand. And uh, that, that turns out to be an extremely expensive and hard proposition. Yeah, I think it not only like uh, like founder, even investor had to realize. I agree that you need to understand the full life cycle of a hardware innovation. Like it's not just easy to upgrade a software system that you could easily upgrade hardware. And if the first generation product is not functional, it would take lots of money to rebuild it. And also another thing is, I feel the concept of doing a hardware innovation or products different from software. Like fancy idea does not always work. And the fancy idea means like this is very sexy, but does not mean that it will be a true critical need for the market or for the industry. Sometimes the new technology in a traditional industry sounds not that sexy or fancy, might really work and solve the problem. Uh, we talked about some of the reasons what, what's not working with, with hardware startups. And, and I think you, you already started going sort of where I want to go with this question, which is what do you think makes a sustainable and successful hardware startup? What, what are the things that, that need to be addressed? You know, for example, some investors say, well, hardware business by itself is not enough, right? You've got to have a recurring revenue piece. There's got to be something, you know, a value at hardware needs to be just the enabler of, of something else. I mean, w w what else in your mind uh, is, 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 is required to, to build large and, and sustainable business? Um, I think what uh, a large sustainable hardware business looks just a large sustainable any kind of business. It has to be high margin, and it has to be highly defensible, and it has to be growing. Um, and you're right to say that um, you know, some of the more traditional hardware models, lower margins, slower growth, those are, are, are turning out of favor. Uh, but we are seeing a lot of really interesting uh, ideas where some combination of hardware uh, um, and cloud services, many times enabled by new data collected by the hardware, analyzed by AI in the cloud, are enabling you know, these kind of uh, uh, services. Um, you know, at our portfolio company, Spry Health, for example, uh, our PNL looks just like a SaaS PNL. The ROI on the hardware is less than a month. Um, so those kind of things, I think, are going to generate a lot of really interesting opportunities that uh, involve hardware, but that deliver a really completely integrated vertical solution in some vertical to bring value to a consumer or enterprise. Yeah, I was just going to say, it looks like many other businesses where you have to have the data, the network effect, the moat. You need those pieces, and it's not about the form factor. It's not about the design. It's really creating that whole ecosystem, and that is back to why hardware is so hard, because you have to have that DNA and skill as well as everything else. And then having the product line to go with it, right? Sometimes some people confuse being a company with having a bunch of products with having a pro one product and essentially a feature pretending to be a product, pretending to be a company. Uh, people who've been able to string together with like good software, good usability, good services on the back end, and a family of products are the ones that have been ultimately been successful. Okay. Uh, we have maybe a minute or two, and I would like to uh, wrap this up with... Um, with a, with a little poll again. I, I would like you guys to, to act as a Wall Street research analyst and issue a buy and sell recommendation. Uh, hardware is, is extremely 
broad in terms of you know various sectors that it covers from from consumer to IOT to to enterprise solutions and all the rest of stuff they, they all follow a different path in terms of um, in terms of market need in terms of hype so why don't you each of you uh, pick one buy and one sell recommendations for a segment inside inside hardware um, uh, space in general any, you know, something that you think will grow and something that we think you would bet on and maybe invest on and, or, or, and something that you you'd never will. Like a whole category? Uh, well, I, I'll give you freedom to decide. We, you want to so talk I, about subcategory or, yeah, or I, maybe a, a type of business? So we're, we're in this business, so I will just say it. So I think consumer IoT is really tough. I would say the, uh, the, you know, the, the novelty of the turning on and off the light inside the home, some of the very simplistic ideas, I think we have morphed beyond that. That being said, so that's my sell, but the buy is I think there are still unbounded opportunities. There's going to be, depending on the research, you know, 30 billion connected devices around the world, and so mass opportunities with decentralization, visual interaction. You know, it will enable a lot of ecosystems. Um, we are long industrial IoT uh, and autonomy, and uh, probably short on consumer hardware as well. Yeah, I think on, on the buy side for me, it'd be things on the enterprise space specifically. I think drones are going to have uh, verticalized drone solutions have really uh, strong use cases and ROIs, in, both in terms of safety and just reducing the dollars to get jobs done when it comes to inspection. So I think that's one that we're excited about uh, on the sell side. Um, yeah, the consumer side is definitely tough. Uh, I'll just pick on the uh, cup that measures what you're drinking. That's, that's, I'm short that one. How's that? Yeah, large market with significant pain points and utility, you know, things. I mean, that's where industrial IoT comes in. Companies can do, like, have massive savings um, of, like, time and money involved in that. Some of the things I definitely short are some of the companies that have been funded, essentially, to do stuff from the, for the homes of the VCs, you know, tackling kind of a mansion in Hillsborough type of functionality. That's not exactly like where the large market is. Or a fancy, really cool cutting edge phone that no one in middle America is gonna hear about or overseas and how do you compete against, you know, say Samsung or, or Apple for that matter to get, uh, to get attention. Yeah, to me, I think uh, industry IoT has been, has been the industry we've been investing on and also see the great potential uh, for the big increase in the next few years, so that's definitely the buy side. And the sell side, I agree, like, consumer IoT, smart home is really tough. Like, it's not saying that there won't be innovation. There will be tons of innovation in smart home, in consumer IoT, but there are no opportunities for small startups. It's all about building up the ecosystem, connect every devices, and also kind of uh, take the data for the potential profit, but who could data data? A big company like Samsung, Apple, so it's really tough for a small startup. Yeah, and I'm going to be very original here. Um, you know, so anything relating to consumer is, is really difficult with uh, um, Amazon and, and Google and uh, others entering the fray in the last couple of years. Uh, and Xiaomi, you know, coming the other side as well. Uh, unless you are part of the Xiaomi ecosystem, uh, and then good, good for you. Um, and on the, on the buy side, um, uh, I think there are interesting things happening in the, in the sensor space. Um, and that connecting uh, industrial applications will create new kinds of, of marketplaces um, and, uh, and you know, bypass trade, for example, and so that, that we can start to see that in, in uh, ag tech, for example. Um, so that's very you know, interesting. Well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time and, and we should probably uh, let the startups present. Yes, thank you. Uh, will you join our jury? You have. I can sit down. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you, judges. It was very interesting uh, opening discussion. Now we have uh, five very exciting startups for your judgment. Uh, we also got nice story from Google, who is supporting this year our present uh, our conference. If you open this story, you'll find out that this year, as opposite to previous, you could use electronic voting system. No dangling charts or whatever we know in general election, uh, but suddenly if you feel un uncomfortable, we're still using our uh, paper version. You could do as you wish. Every other investors, please step forward, take seats on the front tables, and please uh, help us to find the best company by putting your scores. Okay, and 
again, everyone in general, uh, we, we have our public voting, which not counted for, for <clears throat> awards, but you could test yourself by downloading uh, Silicon Valley Open Doors application. You could test yourself against scoring of professional investors. <clears throat> okay, now my very special pleasure to invite probably the youngest ever presenter and founder of, uh, of Silicon Valley Open Doors Pitching Company. So let me invite Kubius. Kubius, Sava, please step forward. Uh, hello. Good luck. Thanks. What is it? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sava, and uh, I'm 13 years old. Uh, I'm the inventor of WowCube, the world's first portable twisty game console, which is a game-changing gaming device on the gaming market today. So, everyone, look at your hands. You are probably holding something in your hands right now. And no, that's not the problem. It's just that uh, we people have a physical need to grasp on something and, and fidget with something in our hands. Um, there has always been uh, many different things people used to fidget with, starting from beads and ending with the recently popular fidget spinner. And of course, we like the things that we fidget with to be responsive and interactive. So, our solution um, is probably combining a um, brain twister with a modern and interactive toy to get the best fidgeting and gaming experience. Uh, intro we're introducing the ultimate device for gaming and fidgeting. Wow, Cube. It's the world's first portable twisty game console. At first look, it kind of looks like a two by two version of the Rubik's Cube, but it has nothing to do with it. It is a console which consists of uh, eight autonomous computers that are talking to each other uh, on the inside through magnetic contacts and sharing the game data. As a result, uh, you, people have the ultimate gaming experience they've never had before. Um, we have many different games, um, such as action games, mazes, arcade games, scrabbles, and more. We also have a mobile app, which uh, allows play, uh, people to get more games uh, to their WowCube. And with our open API, people can create their own games without the need of having a physical version of WowCube, and then put them on our store, the mobile app, for other people to buy. So 25% of the global gaming market is console gaming. And by 2021, the console gaming, uh, the whole gaming industry is expected to be uh, 180 billion dollars, uh, uh, with 39 billion dollars to be console gaming. Our current goal is to uh, expand in the United States console gaming market. Um, yeah. So many experts say that. Um, the already big uh, console gaming market, uh, no, just gaming market, will only continue to grow, but they don't see any other uh, new gaming devices, particularly new gaming devices, coming to the market anytime soon. So, here's some of our competitors. Take a close look at them. They all have something in common. You see it? Yes. It is that they have a screen 
and a few buttons on the sides. That's it. All, all of them are basically the same. But Wildcube, it's different. Wildcube has, has 24 screens uh, and no buttons, which is why we think it will succeed. This is the competitor's market shares. So why uh, is um, Wildcube like, so competitive and good? Well, it's very unique and original. Uh, it's not just a gadget, it's a platform. It's DIY open to anyone. A anyone can do whatever they want with it. And we have four patents on it. Uh, why do we think it will succeed? It's absolutely new. There's nothing like it. You can play games in a way you've never played before by twisting and shaking. You can use Wildcube for gaming, uh, education, or just to relax. Uh, and you can develop your own games and then sell them on our store. And for all the creators out here and DOI stuff, uh, you can build your own version of Wildcube for personal use. And yeah. So our business model uh, is based on sales of hardware, which is the cube itself, software, which is uh, games and apps, and franchise, which is uh, licensing, uh, accessories, and extras. So once we start sales, excuse me, we expect them to go up, bringing our company to the list of future unicorns. <laughs> so we have already raised half a million dollars, which we have spent on prototype making. And we're looking for five more million dollars, which we are going to spend on manufacturing, sales and marketing, uh, research and development, and extras. So we have a team of brilliant people, not me, uh, uh, which are professionals in their own uh, unique ways. So here are some of our advisors. Um, and we're proud to announce that we have four patents in total with one already approved in Russia and three are pending in the US. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you have questions, ask them now. <laughs> Thank you. Question, please. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, but uh, is that consumer hardware? What? Oh. Is that consumer hardware? What do you mean? Yes, <laughs> just a joke from earlier. Uh, the, uh, what, um, uh, can you tell us how many iterations you've made and, and uh, where you're at with the device precisely? What? How many iterations, how many prototypes have you made? Oh, where are you at with the right, device? When right you, now we you're have... going to manufacture, how are you going to launch? Oh, oh okay. So uh, we have, right now we have just six prototypes, but we've already got components coming from China. We just connect them and make them into cubes at home. Uh, but at the end of, of this year, uh, 2018, uh, we're going to start mass production. And uh, in the start of 2019, hopefully, we'll go on the market. We, expect we are also going on Kickstarter in September. Yeah. We expect to get at least 10,000 next year to sell. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see. So I, I think, I mean, that is a sort of kind of like a, a show, a looks like unit. Do you have one that's, uh, that's functional somewhere? Have you, have Th you gotten it? This is functional, look. Uh, right, um, I can't tell the animations from here if it's animated or not. I just, you can play. Sorry. Eh. You can play. The task is to connect all, all pipes. Oh. Okay, cool, thanks. So you connect all pipes uh, so there's no steam coming out on this game. And that's how you win. <laughs> we have all the rest, uh, we need three more hours. So, um, as I already said, um, it, it consists of eight autonomous computers and uh, each one has its own battery. This is why uh, one should. of them can turn off. Cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's neat. Now, thanks for the precision because it's hard to tell at a distance if it. Yeah. And what is the, uh, what is the bomb cost like? I mean, tell the truth. You just like to play a little bit, yes? Yeah. G give him <laughs> some. Give, 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 give your toy. No? Give them, give them, yeah. So uh, considering the price, uh, we hope that the price would be between 200 to 250. Because uh, technically you have uh, two or three iPhones there inside. Right, yeah. So uh, it's, it, it's quite ex expensive toy, but it, it's quite powerful toy. Oh, battery life? Um, we haven't done any tests yet, but we think about five or four hours. Hold um, on. Uh, 
Let me explain. This is a prototype. Sure. Yeah. So to answer your question, we need to make a test of the final version. Yeah. Uh, and the, the answer will be in the end of, of this year. Currently, this is just the, the, <laughs> the, the development stage. We just got this uh, this guy working a couple of years, a couple of months ago. So currently, there there is no answer for for that question. Yeah, because recharging by cable or a magnetic induction. Uh, yeah, the final version will have uh, inductive wireless uh, charging. In each model, you you have uh, battery, and the uh, the way they are connected to each other, they can recharge to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Questions. Any other questions? So you you haven't done user testing yet, but obviously you've put it in front of your peers or your friends. Exactly. Um, so what was the genesis of this idea for you? You were, the inventor, you were the inventor of this product. Yes. Was it based on using another product? Was there other use cases out there? Where you um, it's kind of based on Siptio. Uh, did you ever hear, hear, hear of it? It's like dominoes that have, uh, they can run games on them, but it's completely different. Do you uh, plan to ship it with any initial games when it comes out, or are you dependent on other people to build games to it? How do you think about seeding the market with some initial applications or games? Both. Um, well, we have a few games that we were, we have made ourselves, but as, as I said in the presentation, uh, we're going to have an open API platform for anyone to create games if they know how to program on C. Um, and, and then they can put it on our store for other people to buy. Plus, as I'm responsible for the marketing. Also, currently we are discussing with quite big companies to get the, the, their licenses. So oh. we hope that uh, when we will launch on the market, there will be few very famous games. Uh, I mean, titles which will be recreated from scratch because this is a completely unique device. And you need to, you cannot just port old games. You need to create this from scratch. But uh, I, I guess we'll, we'll surprise the whole community. <laughs> Thank you. OK, more questions? Let's send you Wolf Cube. Thank you. Yeah, Wolf Cube. Um, dear judges, please uh, check if you could enter scores if you have no problem with uh, our new system. This is working okay? Yeah. Yes. And let's check if Google actually help us or just make our life harder. Dear jury, please put score on the paper. Wolf Cube. Sorry, uh, name of the company Kubius. Name of the company Kubius. I maybe make. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. And now my pleasure to invite smart girls. Let's welcome smart girls, please. Yo. Thanks. I just put my product over here. Yeah, I'm in the nasty space of consumers, but I'm <laughs> going to surprise you all with some cool stuff, hopefully. So I was on Shark Tank, and I got a deal with Damon John. I beat 40,000 companies to get there. <sighs> um, Friday night, they're showing it again on ABC, so you'll get a chance to watch me live. That's Richard Branson, he's with my product. I taught him to code, first time ever. We sold 20,000 products, we've done 1.2 million in sales. It's not too bad for a company that's only been in the market in the US for less than a year. So, let's start at the beginning. I'm gonna introduce you to Nina. She's eight years old, she loves reading and writing, but she struggles in math. She's learning how to code in school, but she thinks it's for boys. And why is that? 
because it's reinforced at an early age in two places that matter most to her. At school, where the robotics class or the robotics club has 95% boys as participants, and at play, when she looks at the robots that are on the market, they're either boring and gender neutral or masculine. Nina's my daughter, and she's the inspiration for smart girls. What I found was that Nina was not the only one. Actually, there's millions of girls like this. 70% of girls by the age of 11 start self-selecting away from mathematics and STEM. We have 2.8 million STEM jobs unfulfilled in the US today. Only 7% of women or STEM degrees are actually awarded to women. Schools are desperate to start getting you know, um, coding as part of the core curriculum. And we have this worldwide push to bridge the gender, gender gap. That's where Smart Girls comes in. So our product today is a hardware software program that connects verbal emotive thinking with coding robots. It's my video, just to show you what it's all about. Whoop, where's the sound? Guys, can you fix the sound? No sound? No sound in my video. I, have, I definitely have sound in my video. <laughs> Just talk about it. All right. OK. Well, anyway, in my video, <laughs> I discussed one of the reasons why we made the product and why it's so special and what is in our special sauce. What's unique about Smart Girls is actually I went and I found the only expert on the gender differences between girls and boys. Why is it that we have this gender gap? Is, that, that, you know, is there a reason? We actually looked at the differences between a boy's brain and a girl's brain. And we found out that girls actually have 10 times more white matter, which means there's a reason why they're better at reading, writing, and communication. If we want to like, reach girls, we have to look at applied math and different ways of, like, of reaching them instead of using the same old formulaic way that we've been teaching math and technology. And that's the change. So smart girls, we actually do applied math. So we use storytelling, we use engagement, it's open play. There's a lot of like unique things. Unfortunately, you don't get to see that in my video. But you know, this is um, <laughs> this is a little ciggy. It drives around. There's a lot of um, unique exercises that go along with it. But basically, you get a story, you get engaged with your character, you get involved in her life, and then you have to solve problems um, in her world. Um, via coding and mathematics, and you, and you learn math along the way. So, you know, what's special about us, again, is that we're, like, connecting existing girl play patterns with evidence-based medicine, putting it together, saying girls learn differently, but we can actually be successful. We have, like, a, a less than a 1.5% return rate. We have 4.5 stars on Amazon. It means the, po the products are super popular. I'm going to introduce you to um, our new CMO, Martin Padel. He's a former VP of Hasbro and an EVP of LeapFrog. Thank you, Charmy. Uh, one of the things that really excited me about this brand was the market opportunity. If you look at low-tech products and high-tech products, products that appeal to boys and products that appeal to girls, you'll see many products that, that in the high-tech appeal to boy category, but you see a big opportunity in the area that Nina was looking for, and that's the high-tech appeal to girls uh, uh, category. So we're looking to fill that, and we're looking to fill it as the leapfrog for girls aged 5 to 12, the only brand that says tech is for girls. Our financial opportunity comes in two specific markets, the $1.5 billion uh, school market and the $2.5 billion educational toy market, both which are growing at about 10%. At a 5% market share, that's a $200 million brand. We're working to build that $200 million brand uh, from the ground up. We're starting with our, own, our coding robot for girls in 2018. We're adding augmented reality to that to build out the storytelling, as well as a subscription model. In 2019, we're going to introduce an entire platform of uh, girls' coding products, including wearables and room decor. We're expanding into retail distribution with two great partners. Uh, we're going into the in and after school market with Pitsco, and Pitsco is the company that brought Lego into thousands and thousands of schools, and they've chosen us to work with. And finally, we're going to add non-coding STEM-related products to round out the entire brand. 
We have traction. Charmy talked about a lot of that. One thing I will add to it is we have a, a, a letter of intent from Walmart for a 2019 retail program, and we're in development with Apple stores for an exclusive Apple product. We have a great team that really fits together to, bring this, to, to, to build this brand with over 100 years combined in education, the tech industry, uh, the toy industry, and STEM entertainment, which is really a big deal for us uh, because our latest hire uh, was the star of Mythbusters and White Rabbit, uh, Carrie Byron. She's going to be our chief creative officer as well as our spokesperson and will be a real boost for marketing for us. We're looking for $2 million in this round. We're going to focus in three areas to grow our business, and that's in marketing, that's in development, and that's in uh, general and administrative. Yeah. So quickly, in conclusion, uh, we mentioned Nina at the start. So fast forward a couple of years with some um, Smart Girls curriculum. She was accepted into the NASA Space Camp, <laughs> so pretty cool for her. Um, and generally speaking, we want to say that all girls can be smart girls. Let's work together and level the playing field and, and bridge the gender gap. We hope you join us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you alluded to this. Um, can you just give us a sense of price point, bomb cost, uh, what's going to be upfront versus subscription. You talked about the market. Who are you targeting? That's like so, five questions. I know. Okay. <laughs> if everyone's going to ask those bang, same bang, questions. Bang. I'll, just, do it, yeah. I'll, do it, I'll do it as I can. OK, so um, landed the product is $20. I'm trying to get it cheaper. But you know, landed $20. I sell it for $79.99. My customer acquisition cost is great. I mean, right now it's about 15%. Um, your other question was? Oh, right, the subscription model, yes. So um, we've done, we're very close to our, um, our customers. We have 20,000 customers, and we hear, hear from them on a regular basis. We have like about 10,000 on our Facebook. And one thing that parents have come back to us and said, hey, my daughter loved it. She played six months, which is a long time in the toy business. Um, but you know, how does she continue the learning? So we've come up with a pilot project. We're starting at this Christmas just with our current customers where every month for $9.99, they'll get like maybe a new cute piece of hardware, some new stories, some new coding exercises, um, a little newsletter, stuff like that. And then you know, we're going to go from there. So. And, and in terms of the, of the product, uh, so it's using Scratch today, looks like? Yeah. Any, uh, any uh, plans for uh, Swift Playgrounds? Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. where Apple comes in. So that was one yep. of their demands. So they had, um, they had a few requests. things. They, yeah, requests. I call them demands. Um, one of them is Swift. Um, another one is something very unique for them. It's actually a, a collectability um, possibility. So um, but for us, um, the Walmart product, for example, is a completely new product um, and very different. And so what we keep, how we keep edgy is that we're always coming up with new stuff and we're just churning them out. So you know, it's hard for people to copy because we're out before they're back in again. So it's kind of you know fast consumer goods. And so, uh, so obviously, it's, it's a remote controlled uh, vehicle, et cetera. Are there any yeah. sensors on board, things like that? It's yeah. kind of like. Yeah. yeah, so it has, um, it's actually a self balancing segue. So it, our balancing algorithm is, was created by us, and we own it completely, um, which is cool because it can drive inside, outside, you know, on carpets, doesn't fall over. It has a, you know, like a unique factor to it. Um, and it also has distance sensors on it, so you can prevent it from bashing into walls and um, a gyroscope accelerometer. So it's, it's the highest tech um, product in the market for girls today. Sorry, my, yeah. do you have a microphone also on it, or? Um, no, there's no microphone. Okay, all right. So, so two questions. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that your customers talk to you quite a bit. Mm. Could you elaborate a little bit more about the engagement metrics that you see? What do people do with it and for how long uh, and at what intensity? And the second question is, um, do you envision yourself collecting any type of proprietary data and what kind of uses you might have for that data? Um, I would say to start because you know we were a new company and we were very afraid of collecting data um, because as you know some other companies have run into that especially with children so um, the data that we receive is actually afterwards so after they've received the products and then we do surveys with them you know we have SurveyMonkey and you know so we work with them that way instead of collecting data on the app 
So when you, when you take the product home and you download the app, everything is private from then and we don't collect any information. So, but we would like to change that in the future and, and one thing that um, with the Walmart project is that we will be changing that, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, smart girls. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if our judges put scores, um, oh, can can I have can I have clicker back? And now the next company is Server Dom. Let's welcome Server Dom. Let's welcome Server Dom. <laughs> Server Dom. Oh. You you have. Oh, this clicker. Yes. This is. This is forward. This is back. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Bruce Brady. I am the co-founder and COO of ServerDome. I invite you to step into the future of the data center industry. We uh, we each are contributing to a very significant. Uh, problem, which is the explosion of data. It's both a problem and an opportunity. When I began uh, to search for a disruptive technology with a company that has brought many disruptive technologies to market, I had no idea what the uh, demands of data were uh, imposing on society. Tremendous amounts of energy being consumed through data centers, billions of gallons of water, and a very uh, unfriendly carbon footprint. None of us want to give up our, our data. And we can see this illustration up on the board. In comes Server Dome. What is it? Server Dome is a data ecosystem. So it's more than just a data center. We've rewritten the rule book to make a sustainable and cost-effective solution to address uh, the demands of the data explosion. Here is our prototype working model, four megawatt data center, Hillsboro, Oregon, uh, developed by Oregon Health and Science University and with exclusive licensing rights with uh, Datadome Inc. marketing under ServerDome. Here's some uh, pictures of it, uh, louvered fan walls, uh, uh, what would look like a traditional data center inside. Uh, a cutaway of the data center showing uh, the fan walls. Here we see a top view cutting off the cupola and the arrangement of our hub and spoke design. And then ultimately the secret sauce of the data center, which is the airflow that causes cooling through the server units. Unlike most data centers, we have no mechanical systems, no refrigeration, chillers, uh, all ambient air cooled. As you can see in the blue, there's air blowing through fan walls, uh, then through the servers, and the yellow uh, it, it, uh, depicting the warm air rising and then being exhausted. In the winter time, you can see the airflow is different because we use that to heat and keep a constant set point in the data center. This is unlike any data center out there uh, as to arranging all of the pieces in a very unique and patented design. How far along are we? We have the patents in place, they've been defended. We have licensing agreements in place. We have uh, actually three years of operating data, strategic partnerships forming. Uh, just about to sign one for many uh, server domes in Africa. Marketing sales underway, first project bids submitted, and we have a solid team of uh, uh, leaders and also of advisors. So why are we different? First and foremost, highly energy efficient. When, when you compare us with traditional data centers, we by far are more efficient than they are and consume much less energy. No refrigeration systems or mechanical systems. We have uh, the entire design that operates on the principle of thermal buoyancy. Our modular design is easy to construct and low in maintenance costs. Uh, it can host an array of different types of servers, both legacy uh, and new equipment, so that the continual migration of improvement on uh, servers 
uh, can take place uh, without uh, any disruption of, of the server dome. And really one of the key things that we have boasted in, in our uh, years of operation is 100% uptime, which is a big deal uh, in having your data online. So as far as competition, there are a lot of people in this space. We're not unique. We are not building the first data center. But what we are is we have a, a very unusual combination and approach to handling data. What, what was at when it first came out and was patented, uh, heretical is now becoming uh, a, uh, a highly innovative approach to data. How do we make money? We build and sell one of the most cost-effective and highly efficient data center uh, in the world. Uh, our profit margins between 15 and 20 percent on sales and or licensing, and the, the opportunity is massive. Uh, we have, uh, uh, according to experts in the industry, uh, they say that this industry is growing at about an 18 percent growth rate annually in the United States. Uh, projected through 2020, uh, almost 55 billion in co-location facilities. Worldwide cloud uh, is expected to be about 200 billion. Uh, we are poised to become a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, we're very excited about uh, a, opportunities in many nations across the world uh, to become a solution to the data center problem. Uh, we compare this way, lowest cost to build, low time to build. Uh, average data centers now, uh, 18 to 21 months build time, we can build them in about 12. Lowest energy consumption class, lowest cost to maintain. Our team, uh, proven, over 41, which we heard earlier is a good thing, and our team of advisors is uh, a very solid group of, uh, of prof industry and global professionals. The tsunami of data, according to The Guardian, will consume one-fifth of global electricity by 2001, or excuse me, 2025. So on that, uh, we ask you to step into the future with Serverdome, and I'll entertain questions. Thank you. Now time for questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your potential clients um, and um, uh, the, the process to actually close them and why they will like you better than others? Well, the, uh, the highly ener energy efficient nature is what has caused many clients to take note of us. Uh, Uber's coming to visit next week. Uh, we have uh, people that are in the space of providing hardware that we're in uh, licensing agreements with or discussions with. So, you know, there's anyone that's enterprise level uh, and or edge, because one of the products that we're going to be doing is downsizing the four megawatt facility to uh, a half and then ultimately a rooftop version that will be about, uh, well, one megawatt for the, for the edge facilities and about a half a megawatt for the rooftop version. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the metrics around power consumption and how it compares to maybe the average data center and then sort of what the, sure. the more advanced web scale companies like the Googles and the Facebooks mm -hmm. have been able to achieve? Yeah, we have. What Can we I get... maybe add to the same line of questioning? If you mentioned it, it was, this is cheaper to build and cheaper to operate. Uh, could you quantify that in terms of CapEx and OpEx again compared to the competition that Matt mentioned? And, and, and wait, there's more. Also to Vapor.io, which is also doing some interesting things in terms of uh, data center design. Wow, that's a triple question. Awesome. Uh, the, uh, as far as cost to build, we are very competitive because we have so many less mechanical systems. So in, it's not an easy quantification because you have tiers of data center at, centers in redundancy. So uh, the cost per megawatt runs between 6 and $10 million a megawatt. Uh, which is clearly uh, very um, justifiable. PUE on an average data center is 1.4. Uh, the newer data centers, 1.25 to 1.3. We've run for three years between 1.13 and 1.17 in ener energy savings mode 1.06. So in discussions with some of the innovative technologies coming out, we'll be able to get that even lower. Okay, so as far as the triple question, I hope I covered it. If not, bring, bring it. 
Um, can you tell us about uh, companies that have uh, done something similar in the past and uh, where are they today and their path to IPO, I guess, or uh, what, what happened with that there's kind of no, company? There's no direct competi uh, competitive uh, products out there. Uh, there are some similar designs. We have a patented dome design. The chicken coop that Google uses is uh, that was created by Peter Bloom. Peter's uh, analysis is that ours is better. So that, is, uh, that has lend, uh, lended credibility to ours, and we're also going to be competing for data center of the year uh, next year. So we're uh, very hopeful that we'll be able to uh, validate our concept with that. Do you see this fitting like a certain sweet spot data center size, or does it yeah. scale up and down for, for no, different sizes? No, we can daisy chain them together so we can get up into the 50, million, or excuse me, 50 megawatt uh, zone. Uh, and that's an incremental build, so it's much more cost effective not to have to go for a hyperscale and only use a part of it until you fill it up. Uh, the sweet spot, I think, is going to be edge uh, because there's a very small footprint on the dome. And once we have that engineered, which is one of the reasons that I'm here pitching today, is for uh, venture capital to downsize our engineering uh, and not to do it on a... Um, a uh, agreement that is a licensing agreement which will cause me to have uh, less profitability. So that's where we're looking for a partner to do that and to help us with that point. A question from jury. Okay. Thank you, Sir Rodov. Thank you. Thank all. you. And if everyone complete with the uh, Scoring, and now uh, my pleasure to invite Seren Sensor. Seren Sensor, please. Please welcome Seren Sensor. No back, right? Go. So if you can take an x-ray of your water, would you like what you see? Because if you don't know what's in your water, can you be 100% sure it's doing you and your family no harm? My name is William at Serene Sensors, and our sole mission is to give you that certainty. You may not know, but in 2015, 27 million Americans were served by water systems with at least one health-based violation. Facts like these, they harm the trust we have in our water and lead to more people relying on home filtration systems like this picture here. But there's still a persistent problem that remains. When exactly do you change the filter for these systems? Because right now there's significant guesswork involved, which is leading to adverse health impacts for consumers and potentially lost revenue for filtration companies. At Serene Sensors, our solution is to put your home's water quality in your hand. We want to empower individuals with change filter alerts, emergent contaminant detection, benchmarking against international health standards like the EPA and WHO, safe drinking water standards, and the capability to share and track results over time. I'd like you to meet the Water Shield. It's the world's first line of smart water quality analyzers for the home. For the first time, it will offer water quality testing for the consumer that is affordable, quick and accurate, and that complements filtration systems. We're going to market with seven different parameters, including five heavy metals, uh, common ones such as lead and copper are in high demand, Acidity and dissolved solids in particular will make sure your filter is working optimally. Our product line will launch over the next 6 to 18 months. We'll start with the Water Shield Basic for ultra portable testing. You'll, you'll have results in under a minute. The Water Shield Portable will be more of a travel ready, rugged design. It'll feature basic testing plus the heavy metals mentioned before. And lastly, is the automatic. It'll be completely hands free, automated testing, and it'll install in line with your. Uh, whole home system, such as reverse osmosis under the sink or the ones you find in the whole home in your furnace. Right now, the technology is currently proof of concept, prototype ready. All we're waiting for is the engineering work to be done and to go into manufacturing to launch these devices. When you look at the current landscape for uh, residential water quality testing, the options aren't particularly strong. You have MyDX, which costs $600, more than double our most expensive unit, but it's very expensive for the average household. You have test strips, which are messy and also inaccurate. 
And lastly, you have the City Lab. They can test your water for free, but the catch is that they'll take about a couple of weeks to get back to you with the results. With the Water Shield product line, we're offering three different units at different price points to meet testing needs in different budgets. And in terms of the business model, we are going to sell the devices as is, and we also are going to sell sensor cartridges. Since each test is conducted on a single disposable sensor, we'll be selling sensor cartridges for those who already own the units. So we're aiming to capture a portion of two specific target markets in North America, the residential water treatment market and the smart kitchen market. They're both growing at exceptional rates, and by 2022, they'll be worth over $10 billion combined. Scaling opportunities are also particularly strong. The Asia Pacific market is growing larger than the North American, and it's a larger market too. And there's also opportunities to diversify revenue, such as data licensing to municipalities and technology licensing to water filtration manufacturers. Our team is composed of a complementary mix set of education, experiences, and skill sets. It's important to note that we're currently in the Xerox Research Center of Canada which gives us access to some of the best material science research around. And we're being led by Professor Joseph Wang, who's a true pioneer in the field of nanomaterials, electrochemistry, and wearable sensors. We're currently seeking $850,000 in seed stage funding to launch our first product, the WaterShield Basic. We'll go towards engineering, production line setup, marketing, and R&D. When we look into the future, after launching the Water Shield Basic, we're looking for a second round of funding in 2019 to launch the Portable and Automatic. And by 2022, uh, we'd like to have an exit because we forecast we'll make about approximately $3 million in net profit. So currently, water quality intelligence exists outside the home. What we want to do is bring it inside the home to make sure our filtration systems are working optimally. So the next time you reach for a glass of water, you'll know exactly what you're getting. Thank you. Thank you. A question from judges and jury. So, in terms, so these are working. All your models will work with test strips of various sorts, or sort of test cartridges. Uh, Is it going to be a universal system, or the end line will use a different form factor than the others? Okay, so we'll have two different types of disposable sensors. The first one, the basic, will just be TDS and pH, so acidity and dissolved solids. The second one will be the dissolved solids, acidity, plus five heavy metals, copper, lead, arsenic, and mercury, I'm forgetting one. But yeah, there'll be two different types of uh, disposable sensors sold in cartridges of 26. And presumably these are single use, so you use a cartridge, you have to like take it out, think of putting another one in and having the system uh, and triggering the, the test manually, or? Well, for the basic and portable, you do it manually. You physically insert the disposable sensor, and then after it's done, you take it and you throw it in the garbage. The other ones, the automatic, there'll be a cartridge where it'll be mechanicized, where it'll take it out, push it into a certain spot to test it, then push it back into the cartridge. Hence part of the increased kind of cost per exactly. test uh, with, the, uh, with the automatic one. Okay. That's more of a smart home device. Right. That's what we're aiming for in about a year and a half to launch. How far along are you on the portable one in terms of development and prototyping? We're approximately six to eight months away. We haven't started engineering work for it, but it's going to be in a very simple TDS-style pen shape. That's currently on the market, but the advantage we have is that our TDS meter is five times more accurate than what's currently on the market. And our pH sensor has no comparable option on the market because oftentimes on the market you require a testing solution to calibrate it. You don't need that for ours. There are, there are parts of the world where uh, water quality issues are uh, extremely uh, uh, relevant, right? Yeah. But, but they also happen to be the parts of the world where there are no smart kitchens, nor there is the, really the, the demand to, uh, to, to pay for solutions like that. And where there is uh, uh, funds and where, there, where you see smart kitchens, water quality is usually not a big issue, certainly not top of the mind for consumers. How do you, uh, how do you solve that, that, uh, uh, that problem? Well, we had to launch a Kickstarter campaign last year to focus on water quality issues. And you're right, there's a bit of a challenge in educating the customers about water quality issues because there's a lot of myth, word of mouth, and just perception that surrounds the issue. So what we're trying to focus on for the smart home market is just making your water filter smart. Everyone, a lot of people, not everyone, a lot of people are familiar with water filtration systems. 
They're educated about that, but they know that they don't always change it at the right time. And if you don't do that, it can leach contaminants back in. So we want to focus on the smart filtration market in, I'd say, North America, but in terms of the regions that are more water stressed and have more contamination, and they don't necessarily have smart kitchens. We haven't actually conceived of an idea for that, but it may be a more scaled down solution that's more affordable and accessible for them. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about go-to-market? Is, is it direct to consumer, or do you think there's some natural go-to-market partners in the water ecosystem or smart home ecosystem you might be able to leverage? Right, so we plan on selling on Amazon on our corporate website, and I'm pleased to say today we actually signed a letter of intent with a water specialist in the home, home water filtration area in Canada. They have 30 locations across the province of Ontario. So we want to do Amazon, our website, and water specialist retailers. Emily? Yeah, and so you, um, the price point is obviously quite high, and you said right. the benefit is that it's five to 10 times purification than the sort of $12 one. I'm just curious from studies that you've done, is there a level of contaminant, I'm not a water expert, which is, hey, if, it's, if you're not changing your filter and you're letting 10% more, you know, if it's a 10x more expensive product and the consumer actually, like the benefit they need is a 10% increase in water filter, there's a big gap in that system. And so have you right. played with sort of cost and then you know, 2x the, the sort of level of filtration versus 10x, because it's a very big jump in price from the $12. Um. We haven't played with that as yet, um, but in terms of the five times more accurate, that's for dissolved solids. So the benefit for the user is that they'll be able to do it more affordably than what's currently on the market, and that's what we're trying to market, is that it's more affordable, it's easy to operate, and you use your mobile device to do it. Because the current market solutions, you use like a pen, a pen style device, and it's not as accurate as it could be. So long term, it'll foul. The electrodes will foul. Ours maintain their accuracy for a longer period of time. I'm just curious, those current devices, how are they being sold now? Are they being direct to consumer? Or are they being installed in other devices that have multi-purposes? Well, the actual pen, the, like the portable unit, you'll find on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You Google TDS pen, mm -hmm. you'll find different versions of that on Amazon, yep. direct to consumer. And is that, um, you know, 500,000 people using it, a million? I'm just curious how broad that current market share is. We couldn't find data on that, but by talking with the people on our campaign, no one ever brought it up to say, you know, we have this device, why do we need yours? And that's why we're going to have the TDS and pH plus the, uh, the heavy metal contaminants to show that we're more of a comprehensive solution. Can you comment maybe on the, the technology? What about it is defensible and yeah. hard to replicate? Okay, so it's a proprietary CMOS chip. Our uh, CEO has des ASIC design experience of over 10 years. He's designed his own chips. It's nanomaterials. That's what actually detects the chemistry. It's electrochemistry. And the last thing is electrodes, proprietary electrodes. So those three components are making it defensible. Six patents, and it's costed over a million dollars to get it to that level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now let's welcome Smart Mimic. Smart Mimic. Let's welcome. Thank you. As my co-founder, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Noyan. Uh, I'm here with my co-founder, Sardar. Uh, Sardar and I, France, for 14 years. I'm working for five years. And this is our second startup. Hello. Uh, everything is getting smart. From your phone to diaper pail to coffee machine, everything is becoming smart, right? It's crazy. But the problem is, in the, our life, there are still a lot of things that still is dumb, like your door, your bicycle, backpack. So most likely, you need to wait 10 years, or for sure, will spend a lot of money to make everything smart. So instead, we make one device to make your things smart. Ladies and gentlemen, Mimic Plus. Mimic Plus is a plug and play multifunctional platform that you can take with you wherever you go. It has several sensors built in that allow you to measure movement in front of the device, change in temperature, position, and acceleration. It has several connectivity options like Bluetooth, LP1, and Wi-Fi to connect with your smartphone. 
It has powerful alarm and colorful light. It can also work as a swarm. So, all right, how do you use this device? It's very simple. With the Mimic application, you can select this scenario, and we have dozens of those. Let's have a look at some of them. Think about placing your Mimic onto your door. It starts off its alarm if your door is forced. Or, someone is knocking your door and you just don't hear it, Mimic will send you a notification that someone is on the door. It detects human motion in a very wide angle, so no one can walk into your home, your hotel room, office, without your knowledge. No one will even be able to open your drawer without triggering Mimic. Mimic Plus is your best friend for travel safety. It can notify you if your belongings, like suitcase, laptop, change their position or getting far from you. Another possible application is with your bicycle. You can use it as a rear light, at the same time, rear brake light. When you leave your bike, it turns into an alarm automatically. We'll let other users to create their own scenario and publish it in the same application, and it's so easy. It works with if this, then that. And moreover, you can talk to your mimic, like ring the alarm when my backpack gets open. It understands and works as a work to light, uh, alarm, sorry. You want to keep this device alive. As we mix our scenario-based devices, uh, we know when and where people are using or creating those scenarios. So we can obtain consumer insights data, data from it. <coughs> yeah, this is our comparing picture, the big picture. Um, the red circle in the middle suggests built-in scenarios, the mimic built-in scenario. The other dot one is custom scenarios. This area are limited by your imagination. And our competitors are here in this big picture. We nearly reached $300,000 revenue since December in Turkey. And those are our key partners that we work and planning to work with. Now we are about to close $2 million sales agreement with an insurance company in Turkey. And we make money from customer behavior analytics data, hardware revenue, commission revenue, and subscription revenue. This is our roadmap. We are getting all necessary certifications for US market. Uh, we are trying to close one or two deals in the US, uh, like we did in Turkey. Uh, and we, are plan to, we plan to uh, start Kickstarter campaign for PR purposes. And our team is capable enough for all necessary tasks required. And now we are raising $1 million for expanding our team, PR campaigns, and R&D and production costs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Smart Mimic. Time for questions. Yeah. So, oh. yeah, can you just at a high level take us through the tech stack here? What is the sensors? Like, what is actually inside here? The sensors? It's proprietary versus what you guys built using off the shelf. Like, what's the, what's the innovation here? Well, uh, the innovation is we have the IP that, like, it's a bunch of sensors, and individually, there are many sensor devices, right? So we make this. With this software, this application, there are scenario, and you select this scenario. I'm just giving an example. For example, you're making your camping, right, the outside. So you want to protect your area with the motion sensor. And at the same time, you can use it in the home. But the sensor's calibration are different from outside to inside. So instead, the customers um, uh, make the adjustments of the sensor. They just select the scenario. And automatically, it does the task. And moreover, this innovation part is about to, it's being a platform. So kind of, we don't want it to just use it in a bike or just for camp or home. We just want to kind of keep it alive and we want other people to make scenario and share it. Like. So one, one of the, the questions that come to mind for me is kind of what's your place in the ecosystem? Uh, for instance, you develop your own kind of like tile slash tracker like competitor. Um, you know, tracker, I think, does have a licensing program where you can build things in. Did you consider that? Are you supporting things like SmartThings, HomeKit, the various kind of Google ecosystem uh, integration uh, to, uh, to kind of chain actions together with other devices, or are you trying to keep it really kind of insular? Uh, we are planning to uh, integrate our system to HomeKit and SmartThings also, uh, but we have uh, the ecosystem of scenarios, so um, it could be a little, uh, little bit uh, low for uh, those uh, ecosystems for our uh, requirements. Um, so you, you are competing obviously with, with Tile on the, the Mimic and then there is Mimic Plus, right? 
Yeah. Um, Intel managed to get to uh, uh, you know, significant volumes, which in turn has helped them to actually have uh, enough margin to survive uh, entering retail. Um, and um, what, uh, so what, what kind of margins and, and prices do you uh, plan to attack the U.S. market with? Yeah, right now uh, we are planning to sell in U.S. market $69, and uh, the margin is 80%. How much? 80. Uh, $69. Mm -hmm. And right now we have uh, 13,000 customers, users in Turkey. Also. Same question about data. Where do you envision yourself collecting proprietary data, and how do you intend to use it? Well, the data, first of all, we know what other custom needs. Like, we find, like, they are really some kind of funny and so creative scenarios that people are trying to build in. So we know their needs. For the B2B, like, about, uh, for this insurance example, for example, like, uh, we know people, like, as he said, like, where and where they need, um, for example, when, when they want to protect, protect yourself in home, or you're going to travel and you feel insecure. And at that time, I know this data, and I can offer him or her something about to do with, like, insurance or an, other health. So we use the data kind of like that for the different for B2B and B2C. Last question. No more questions? Okay, thank you, Smart Mimic. Thank you. Thank you. And now I appreciate if judges uh, com complete scoring. Did you enter? Did you hit? Oh, perfect. And now it's uh, in conclusion of this panel, I would appreciate if each one of you say, what company got you most excited out of last five? No doubt, the cube. <laughs> you like <Yeah>. toys. <laughs> I liked uh, Smart Girls and Smart Mimic. I thought those were the two most interesting ones. Okay. Emily? I would just say absolute props for the 13-year-old for getting up here. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, and his stand. Um, the more sales, the merrier, so the, the Smart Girls. Okay. The Smart Girls. Smart Girls. I like the, uh, I mean, the data center aspect, you know, to be a little bit contrarian was, uh, was really uh, interesting, this real opportunity there. I mean, but a lot of them were, were quite uh, cool as well. Okay. Uh, I like the dome because I think the problem is pretty real that they're solving. Not sure if this is really an IT company uh, as opposed to being a sort of a construction company, which, which could be a great business, by the way. Um, but as a father of three, uh, the cube, uh, I can see my kids loving this, so... So that'll be a that'll be a valid for. So they have waiting list for kinds of first adopters, uh, and if you cannot get in the list, tell me I have some ways in. Uh, friends, let's thank our judges, our jury, and companies for hard work presenting and talking this panel. Yeah.